Showtime. Welcome to Financial Fridays. I'm your host, Glenn Cleland, aka the Intellectual Venture Capitalist. I've gone from investing in stocks to investing in students. Our topic today is the Futures Atlantic Symposium. So why should you listen to me? Well, I was the founding director of the Center for Financial Studies at UMB. My job was not only to find talent, but also develop it, get it ready for it employment in the investment and financial industry. I was also the former founding member of the senior management team at New Brunswick Investment Management Corp. So I have the unique perspective that I've been on both the buy side as an institutional equity portfolio manager, but also on the sell side as a wee little capital markets associate. I also have this little thing, the CFA charter, which helps me get my foot in the door. So today we're gonna to talk about the Futures Atlantic Symposium, something we created at UNB to improve the employment opportunities for the students. A shameless plug, the flagship of the Center for Financial Studies is the Student Investment Fund Program, which I created. We're profiled in the National Post as being the first in the Atlantic region. We're profiled in the Globe and Mail because of our market neutral strategy, teaching the students hedge fund, hedge fund techniques. We're profiled in a documentary in CBC. When I left, we were number one undergraduate program in Canada in terms of assets under management in 2016 with close to 9 million in assets under management. And with the CFA curriculum embedded in the program, we were one of a kind in the world. Now we had four key performance indicators in the Student Investment Fund. Portfolio performance, CFA pass rates, university competitions, and ultimately the graduates. And so we're gonna be fo focusing on the graduate side. Why do you care about the UMB program? Because look at how successful the graduates are being. We were all about career relevant learning. That was our brand. To borrow from, paraphrase from Chancellor Dick Curry at UMB, the ultimate success has, of the university has nothing to do with the faculty, the architecture administration, but the graduates from the university. Now, the Futures Atlantic Symposium was inspired by a comment by a senior bank official when we were in Toronto one time, and he admitted that he'd rather have the 15th best from Rotman School of Business than the Indian Maritime region. I said, well, hang on a sec. Not only my students have a 50% better pass rate in the CFA than the industry pass rates, and we have over 15 podium finishes, of which six are international wins, but you've got Mount Allison and St. of X, number one, number two, typically in the McLean's Business Magazine profiling universities. You've got Dalhousie, which is almost the Ivy League of universities, at least in the Maritime region. And then you've got St. Mary's with a similar program to ours. He admitted he just didn't have the resources to come down to the region. So that's what inspired the Futures Atlantic Symposium. We decided we were gonna become the surrogate HR. But what was unique about it is it was gonna to have to be collaborative, where we invited all the students to one place to interview for jobs, so then all the banks would come to the one place. I didn't mind if my students lost the jobs to other students, as long as someone in the region got the job, because the one time, that we didn't find somebody suitable in the region, the banks would not come back. But it was not easy. I'll never forget one time when we went to the banks and we eventually got all the banks in except RBC, which is an interesting story. We got Scotia, we got BMO in at one stage, TD and CIBC. I'll never forget one time when we talked to the HR and they brought in they had senior management, all with an Atlantic based background. And the HR person came in and I kid you not, she said, why would we do anything in the Atlantic region? Our lesson was, you had to bypass HR, which is a deselecting process, and you had to get directly to the decision makers. Same situation happened in universities. Everybody was so competitive, they basically said, why would we do anything with the University of New Brunswick? But the students needed it, and so we appealed directly to the students. And so we started the Futures and Learning Symposium in 2006. You can see by the website that we had here, we had on the top, we had the conference agenda, then we had the speakers biographies and the speakers came from everywhere, not only just Toronto, but also from, we had them in from London, England, New York, California. We had promotional opportunities, just different ways to find, fund the actual futures. We had career postings and that was the most important. We had at one stage up to 15 different career opportunities for the students. We had the either equity research side, investment bankers, or some buy side opportunities. We had some back office opportunities also locations and accommodations. We tried to get it so the students only had to spend one night in Fredericton because always considering their student debt levels. Registration in the center. 
the genius of the Futures Atlantic Symposium, the person who put in all the hard work, attention to detail, was the person in the middle, Susan Boyce. She not only coordinated everything, the toughest was coordinating all the job interviews for all the different banks, but she coordinated everything. My job was to create the, the agenda in terms of the speakers, and we always had a speaker involved. This particular year was Imad Elson. So there's the typical Futures Atlantic Symposium. We held it at the Wu Center, which is the biggest site at the time at University of New Brunswick. It had the Kent Auditorium, which was the biggest auditorium. It held over 200 students. The book Rocking the Boat talks about Futures Atlantic Symposium 2008, where we had the most participants ever, over 200 students there. We were getting them from 10 different universities in the region, the largest being St. Mary's and Dalhousie. And as you can see there, there's a networking opportunities there where they had opportunities to talk to industry professionals. We had trade booths outside. This one was, Bloomberg was a regular at this event and they showed the students what the industry professionals actually used. We also had Kaplan, which provided third party information on how to approach exams like the CFA Charter, CAIA, ERP, FRM, and the like. Now, we always started the conference at one o'clock because we considered that a lot of students would be coming from Halifax. They, we thought they had a four hour drive. Started at one o'clock. We did career development the first day. This was all about explaining to the students what is investment banking? What is the buy side of the street? And so we introduced them to the capital markets flowchart. This was integral to understanding career preparation. And so on the left-hand side was the sell side, the right-hand side, the buy side. And we tried to explain how everything interconnected. And a lot of the jobs were within this matrix. It's so important we set up a separate Financial Fridays video to explain the culture, how you move around in it. Now we found a lot of the students actually didn't want to ask questions because they didn't want to look stupid. So one of the geniuses, Susan Boyce, is you created what they called the round table mentoring form. It was like a kissing booth where we had at each table a different topic and a professional talking, talking about the topic and the students for 15 minutes got to talk to that professional about that topic. So as you can see, some of the topics were fixed income derivatives, alternative investments, credit default swaps. This was by far the favorite for the students. By five o'clock, we had our networking receptions. Now, for those that got job interviews, they went upstairs to the cocktail hours. This is when their interview started because the interviewers wanted to see if these people could actually think on their feet. Could they actually, the interviewers were asking themselves, could they actually work with this person 80 hours a week? For those people that didn't have any interviews, we had elevator pitches available before the conference began where they got to convince the recruiters in one minute that they should be interviewed. My most memorable one was one student talked about how he was always told throughout his hockey career that he was too small, but he persevered and made it up to a high level was a story about perseverance and sure enough, he got an interview. We also always arranged it during the Harvest Jazz and Blues Festival so that the students could go out or even professionals for that matter uh, during the biggest event, arguably in Fredericton's yearly events. Here's the mentoring table. You can see what happens. The students are all around the mentor and asking about a different topic. Second day was professional development. I was a member of the Atlantic CFA Society and this second day counted for CFA continuing education for CFA charter holders. That bought the industry professionals there and that was another networking opportunity. These were all presentations on topics the students wouldn't otherwise get in class. So you've got Kevin LeBlanc talking about career and trends in the investment management business. My favorite was the conversation with industry leaders where Tom Liston interviewed various leaders, Mike McBain, who was with East Coast Fund Management at the time. I should mention Mike McBain was actually the father of the Futures Atlantic Symposium. At the time, he, he was the president of TD Securities and provided the initial funding. So Mike was instrumental. He subsequently went on to start East Coast Fund Management, which is the buy side. Danny McCarthy was a regular on the sell side. And that interview I thought was just brilliant. We always ended with a keynote speaker. This was in 2011, David Hay was a keynote speaker, but we had uh, people like Barbara Stimus, former president of the TMX Group, we had Frank McKenna, former Premier of New Brunswick, who is the Vice Chair of TD, as a keynote speaker. From this conference, it created opportunities. Uh, we have Kent, we're gonna be interviewing Kent Fox, who showed real perseverance, although he didn't get initially an interview, 
I believe with TD Securities, he kept in touch with them and he subsequently did get a job. So we'll talk about Ken about the futures. Then we've got Sean McNulty, his nickname Big Red because he had a red shirt on, which was totally against the, the norm. And I think he had about two or three different job opportunities and we'll interview him to see how that helped him in his career path. So there you have it, the Futures Atlantic Symposium. It was key in terms of creating employment opportunities, career preparation and networking opportunities for the students. That's the long and the short of it. Remember to work hard, play hard. And for those SIF graduates tuning in, remember the old card that I used to hold in my wallet. A hundred years from now, it won't matter what your bank account was, the sort of house you lived in, or the kind of car you drove, but the world might be different because you were important in the life of a young person. I always remember that, that's what drives me. So please join us in the next Financial Fridays, and hopefully we'll next be having some interviews. Cheers.